Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay in the, in the back? That's great. You know, this word, embracing the future, I, um, I, I think it's really central to what I'll be talking about today. I learned the importance of embracing, embracing the future on my honeymoon. My wife and I went to the Grand Canyon, and we were riding these uh, donkeys down into the canyon, and she was in front of me, and hers tripped, and she goes, that's one. And then her stumbled the second time, and she goes, that's two. And then the third time, it really stumbled. She goes, that's three, and she gets off and pushes her, off, her donkey off the edge. And I said, geez, honey, I know it tripped, but aren't you overreacting? And she said, that's one. <laughs> so <laughs> I've learned to embrace the future. And what I'm going to do today is talk to you about what exactly does making value mean in contrast to making things. I'm going to then... I'll give you the background on a National Academy of Engineering study that was just released on March 2nd. And then I've set aside some time for us to have a discussion. Um, this is a great university. I think the University of Michigan is doing a lot to help pe make, make people make value in the future. But hopefully I'll make the case today that this is such an important subject for everybody's future that it's worth having a little more dialogue just to make sure we haven't overlooked something here that we might be doing differently. Um, Chuck Vest, I know all of you know Chuck, actually was a catalyst for this work. Um, he, uh, as president of the National Academy, made the following statement, far too much of our nation is waiting for new ways of working to arrive. We hear lots of rhetoric about how the nature of work will change as if it relates to some unknown distant future. The fact is that it is happening now and we need a broader recognition of this fact and the policies and education that reflect it. Uh, so Chuck really um, had been around MIT when MIT did a Made in America study in 1989. He'd been around MIT and studied making things. And I think he, he really felt, and this was back uh, right at the time of the last presidential election, that the rhetoric around jobs had really become one focused on outsourcing. And his experience told him, as did mine, that a lot of what was happening with jobs had to do with fundamental improvements in productivity, that a lot of jobs were just simply going away, not just because of plant floor productivity, but because of the way that products were being designed so they were e easier to produce, the way in which we could do uh, white collar work more productively. So Chuck wanted to take this dialogue to a higher plane, I would say, and find a way to discuss the future uh, beyond just um, the outsourcing of jobs. Now to contrast this, um, I like to think in terms of making things versus making value. The 1989 Made in America report at MIT was done by the MIT Commission on Industrial Productivity. So 25 years ago, they really felt it was important to give a careful look at how things are produced. They coined the line, uh, for a nation to live well, it must produce well. And the question I ask is, produce what? So a lot of us think in terms of producing things, what I'm going to talk about here are two examples of two different companies. One produced things and one produced value, and the consequences are dramatically different. So the first company is one near and dear to my heart. I spent 40 years of my life with General Motors, and from 1992 to, 19, to 2007, I would say we became very good at making things. We really transformed how cars and trucks were produced with designs for manufacturing, lean manufacturing, global sourcing, I won't read the whole list, math-based design and engineering, throughput improvement, compelling designs. And um, quite honestly, GM probably should have went bankrupt in 1991 and through the work of a lot of people focusing on these fundamentals for how to make things better, uh, we didn't. We um, actually had our market cap up to $66 billion by 2000. Unfortunately, by 2007, it had declined again. And we just simply couldn't get in front of the legacy costs that we had taken on as part of the history of making things. And as a result, we went bankrupt in 2009. So here was a company that worked very, very hard at becoming better at making things. And all of the numbers would indicate that that offload to the bottom line, it still wasn't enough. Now let's look at a company, company that's been focused on making value, and that's Apple. The remarkable part of this story, and many of us forget the fact that in 1997, just 18 years ago, Apple was, was, was within six months of going bankrupt. Um, they lost $1.6 billion. They brought Steve Jobs back to be the interim CEO, and their market cap was $2 billion. So he stopped the bleeding and 
took some initiative and by 2000 they had a successful iMac. They returned to profitability. He had become the permanent CEO again and had moved the market cap to 16 billion. So that's, that's pretty good. I think most of us would say that's, that's great progress. Look what happened. 2001 to 2015, retail stores, iPod, iTunes, iTunes stores, MacBook Pro, iPhone, Apple TV, apps, iPads, Apple Watch, $700 billion market cap. So this is a subject that you might say maybe it's long term. This wasn't long term, 18 years. It's a remarkable story. I would contend it had a lot to do with, with making value. The iPod, for example, wasn't just about storing more songs. It was a complete rethink of the interface that we have with music. It allowed us to download music from our computers. It allowed us to um, actually have um, a, 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 an experience of a user interface that many of us had never had before. And then there was inventions like the glass uh, with Dow getting involved. So it really was a transformation in terms of how value was created and the experiences people had around music. Now this is a different metric. This is a company called Brand Z, and they attempt to value brands. So this is not market cap. What's interesting about their top 100 brands, six of them I would contend that are in the top 11 are companies that, at least from my reading, are explicitly focused on design innovation, focusing on the customer, really driving value and their combined brand values are 560 billion. If you look at the six auto companies that made the list of 100, those six combined are 97 billion. I would contend a lot of that has to do with the difference between making value and making things. So the evidence would suggest that when you focus on making value, you build strong, strong brand equity. It leads to superior financial returns. So what exactly am I meaning by making value? It's the process of using ingenuity to create value for people in society. So that's kind of a simple definition. That's what we landed on in the National Academy work. Uh, a little more deeply, the value results from integrating customer understanding, innovation, design, engineering, production, distribution, and service. And it's to provide compelling and consistently positive customer experiences. The point here is that what you're designing and engineering isn't a thing. A thing is part of an experience, and you really need to understand how to make those experiences compelling and, very, very importantly, consistently positive. So that's that transition from making things to making value. In the context of making value, you tend not to do that all by yourself. Very few companies can create all of the value that they give to their customers alone. Companies tend to operate in interdependent activities that are performed in a value network. So this spans locations around the world, different economic sectors. It involves work by many different companies and many different people. But at the end of the day, it's driven by those end desires of the customer that ultimately realizes the experiences from the value that's been created. So understanding making value as a network becomes very, very important. So what are the key success factors behind stories like Apple's? And there's a lot of other stories like Apple. First, it's an integrated system that maximizes the value over the entire global network. Second, it's this design innovation focused on the total customer experience. Third, it's technology innovation to ensure that these compelling experiences exist. And very importantly, it's operational excellence to ensure consistently positive experiences. All of these are are necessary conditions to excel in making value. And when you put this integrated system together, you put the customer experience in the center. That's what drives it. And you think about this as all of these pieces working together as a system. Organizations get challenged by trying to work in functional silos. So you have an engineering department, a manufacturing department, a purchasing department. And in fact, the real um, breakthroughs are those companies that can integrate that together and focus on the compelling experience. This whole thing about design innovation is critically important. In fact, a Nobel Prize was granted here at University of Michigan, uh, Professor Tversky, on utility theory. This was many years back. And basically what this work really proved out was that a negative experience is probably worth about 10 positives. <laughs> so linear, utility curves aren't linear. 
So you really, really pay dearly as a company if your customer has a negative experience. Um, the story I like to put behind this, some of you may have heard of, but my wife and I wanted to go see a movie a few years back, and I asked her, what did you want to see? And she said, I'd like to, I'd like to see Titanic. So I get in the car and I drive to Blockbuster, and they don't have Titanic. So I come home with Harold and Kumar, go to the White Castle. And we watch a movie that my wife didn't want to watch, and then I forget to take it back. Three days later, I remembered I had to take it back. When I took it back, I got fined. So what's wrong with this story? I had to drive to get the movie. They didn't have what I wanted. We watched what we didn't want to watch, and I got fined for having done all of that. And I had to take it back. So the Netflix comes along and looks at Blockbuster, and what do they do? They create a whole new business model using some innovation. You can keep the movie as long as you like. You always get what you want. You don't pay any fines. And lo and behold, Blockbuster goes under, and Netflix is prospering. So this is, I believe, the ultimate sustainable advantage because it gives you both low-cost products and services and premium prices. And that's what was behind all that money that Apple made. Part of what amazed me wasn't just their products. How does Apple have so much capacity in place when the prices are at a peak? In the auto industry, that's not how we would do it. We would never risk all that capacity and bet that everybody's going to love my car so much that we can sell at premium prices and sell out the capacity. So historically, strategy was you, you, you were either going to be the low-cost manufacturer or differentiator. And actually, what we're seeing through making value is the ability to do both, and that's pretty powerful. It's this combination of technology that really was capturing the attention of the NAE committee, and I'll get into the committee a bit more. And I use plus signs here instead of bullets because it is all of this taken together. Information is the Internet of Things, cloud computing, and Moore's Law. Uh, communications is the machine-to-machine -machine communication as an example. Robotics is autonomous vehicles, enhanced sensors, and dexterity. On robotics, by the way, uh, uh, robots used in a electronic assembly today are $4 an hour machines. Uh, we're going into a UAW contract here in the next year or so. There'll be a lot of discussion about two-tier two wages. That'll be a debate around $18 an hour versus $28 an hour. And we're talking about assembly robots that equate to $4 an hour. On the process side, it's additive manufacturing, 3D printing, sustainable manufacturing, advanced machining, forming, remote diagnostics, prognostics. You understand the materials with nanotechnology and what you're doing with the New Materials Innovation Center. Work systems are changing, um, advanced systems design and engineering, um, intelligent software and knowledge work, the next steps for virtual design and engineering, big data and speed to insight with analytics, and then energy with enhanced gas and oil recovery, renewables and storage, everything taken together. Finally, with operational excellence, there's this company called Under Armour. You may remember during the Olympics, Under Armour had made the suits for the speed skating team, and the U.S. speed skating team did not live up to expectations. So everybody was quick to blame this on Under Armour. And this guy, Kevin Plank, made this quote, brands are all about trust that is built in drops and lost in buckets. And I, I really felt that was a compelling way to summarize what he was living through at that moment. Um, so operational excellence is the key to consistently positive experiences. We know there's a lot of best proven practices uh, that are being taught here at the university all the time, but there's a lot of new opportunities be related to big data and advanced analytics, advanced robotics, virtual design and manufacturing and engineering, low-cost sensors. All of these things are giving us new ways to excel even more with our operations. And what really is driving us in, in the committee work was the fact that when you put all these things together, focus them on compelling customer experiences, operate it as an integrated system, integrating this technology and driving it with the focus on operational excellence, uh, that the world changes dramatically. And we're living through this now, but our point here is it's going to change even more and probably even faster. So let me give you three very simple uh, examples of, to, to bring this together. Um, I get called frequently by um, entrepreneurs 
exploring startup companies. And a year or so ago, one called me up and said, hey, I've got an idea for custom producing blue jeans. Now, in my case, I have a lot of blue jeans in my closet. None of them wore out. My wife said they wore out from a fashion standpoint. She's a hairstylist and says, you can't go out on those grandpa jeans. You've got to wear tighter jeans. And a month later, they've got to be a different color and all of this. So this custom tailoring of jeans is an interesting idea. So this person's idea was a body scan of the lower body. So they have a digital print of me. And then all I need to do is check rivets, stitching, faded, not faded, holes or not, how tight they fit in the legs, and in one day delivery of a custom produced pair of jeans. And he felt he had all the robots, the cutting, the stitching, the sewing, all of the stuff necessary to pull that off. So that was kind of interesting, certainly a different business model than what the Gap experience is. Imagine how much inventory the Gap carries because of all those variants of jeans and all the sizes of people. And if you can really get one day custom tailored jeans, it could be an important business model. Now let's think about shoes. What can you do by scanning my foot? I run a lot, scan my feet, do a dynamic uh, recording of how I run, and then the next innovation on the shoe would be 3D printed. So now they know exactly what I need for how I run, and there's a new fashion in shoes. Rather than sending me the shoes, they'll send me the data, or maybe send somebody in a store nearby the data, and I, I don't think it's a stretch of imagination at all that the materials combined with the 3D printing technology could begin to make appropriate shoes with appropriate structure and fashion. Now think of what that means for Nike. Think of all of the different shoe sizes and styles that they carry on their distribution system and what that means for the retail experience. Now the final one is near and dear to my heart, and some of you have, have heard this a little bit. I'm going to give a quick overrun of what's going on in mobility. Historically, cars have been mechanically driven with combustion engines, oil-based fuels, mechanical and hydraulic controls, operating standalone by a person for general purpose. That's been going on for over 100 years. And now a new DNA has come along for mobility with electric motors and diverse energy, connected, shared, and driverless cars and tailored designs. It's not any one of those, it's all of those together. We'll live over in this world and in this world, so the real word here is and. But the fact is, this combination of technology and business models promises to be transformational. When you combine connected, coordinated, shared, driverless, and tailored vehicles, you really have a chance of providing better mobility experiences at radically lower consumer and societal cost. And it's this kind of thinking that's been a motivation for the recently created Mobility Transformation Center here at University of Michigan. This is a big deal. This is a real transformational opportunity. Google's working hard on driverless cars. Now imagine once you take the driver out of the car, how that changes the design of the car. No steering wheel, brake pedal. Uh, and the assumption here is these cars won't crash, or even if they do, the physics will be far less severe. So this is a quite different kind of a car. In fact, when you really think through these two-person pods, I believe eventually they're going to weigh about 1,000 pounds instead of a 3,500-pound car. That makes them much more amenable to electric drive. I think they'll have about one-tenth as many parts as cars as we know them. And they're going to be predominantly electronic machines made by those $4-an-hour robots. So what does it mean for the jobs in the traditional auto industry if the machines we're moving around in have one-tenth as many parts and have one-fourth the mass and has a different production system, a propulsion system? Some people are taking this even further. Local Motors at the Detroit Auto Show were showcasing their ability to 3D print electric cars. The idea here is to crowdsource, um, to do your financials in that way, to um, have an underlying chassis that would have global scale, but the upper bodies be tailored locally, and to totally change the way you put a team together to do a car and produce a car. Um, when you really begin to think about the business model of today's industry, sell vehicles, gasoline, and insurance, versus the one that others are seeing where they sell miles, trips, and experiences, you realize this is transformational. 3 trillion miles a year, 67 cent out-of-pocket cost per mile when you own and operate a car, and at median income when you move 30 miles an hour, you value your time at 83 cents a mile. 
That's $1.50 total, $4.5 trillion are in play for those who can disrupt the traditional mobility industry. And why is this so important? How might Apple, Google, Uber, Amazon, Local Motors make value by transforming mobility? How might they just think about this differently? Think about how Apple made value already today. How might this impact the automobile, insurance, energy, and freight industries? and the jobs in these industries. Some of us were meeting with a visitor here on campus last week. He shared with us the fact that in every state, the census data indicates the most common job category in every state is driver. And what if you have driverless vehicles? What does that mean? So this really sets up the underlying concerns for what the National Academy Committee was trying to get at. And that is, we're seeing a lot of value get created from the convergence of technology and business models. And it is really making some people very wealthy, but it's leaving a lot of people behind. And I think we've entered into one of these harsh realities like the world lived through when we went from an agriculture economy to a manufacturing economy. We're living through that again. And so uh, Nick Donofrio chaired this committee, actually it was the second committee. Panos and I served on the first one. Chuck had asked us to actually frame up a different way of thinking about this. And this is really where the concept of making value emerged. And then Nick was able to get uh, working with Chuck and, and others additional funding to carry it to the next level. And so we put a, a committee together. We had some economists, we had some R&D lab leaders, uh, Xerox Park, Boeing, uh, we had, um, some um, uh, labor people. So we tried to have a pretty diverse team of people to do this. And we did a, a National Academy report on making value for America. This is the infographic. I'll hit these points real quick and then I wanna deep dive them a little bit more. First, it's um, advanced technology, global growth, and new business models are changing the way products and services are conceived, designed, made, and sold. I don't have to preach that here. I think the University of Michigan understands that fully. You've done a whole lot to get in front of these things and you're enabling a lot of people to have good jobs making products and designing products different than when I went to engineering school. The competition is increasing around the world and very importantly, jobs are changing. Uh, some factories are operating with one third the people that they had in the 1960s. Some studies of the future of work are indicating that half of the US jobs are ripe for disruption from automation. Any job that tends to have this repetitive characteristic to it is ripe for disruption. These tend to be middle class jobs or certainly stepping stone jobs to the middle class. Then these advanced machine learning and robotics will likely affect work in transportation sales and after sales services. So yes, there's some fundamental things going on with work here. At the same time, there are some pretty exciting opportunities. There are companies that have improved their production efficiency by over 50% through best practices. There are companies that are putting together service and software and sales businesses and creating all new ways of finding revenue. Emerging tools like 3D printing, cloud computing, crowdsourcing are allowing entrepreneurs to uh, start up with lower upfront money. And very, very importantly, estimates of the demand for value and products and emerging economies is as high as $20 trillion by 2025. So that, if we get it right here in America, if we're the leaders in making value and that value is sought after in these emerging markets, maybe we have a chance to export a lot more than we've been exporting. So we had five categories of recommendations and conclusions. We'll get into this a bit more. But to prosper in the face of these changes, U.S. businesses and communities need to embrace the change. I think that's really the most important first step, that this is coming, it's inevitable. Strengthen innovation and productivity. So this is about best practices, not just lean manufacturing, but what is the best practice book equivalent to the machine that changed the world or the Toyota production system as it relates to making value? Education. Um, collaboration and uh, inclusiveness. Since I'll get into these in more depth, so I won't read, read those sub bullets. So let me just focus a little bit more then on what, what we can land it on. Um, again, these globalization technology and business models are 
changing how products are made. They're transforming work and manufacturing operations in very significant ways. And they're reshaping the labor market. And I think this is the, the, probably one of the biggest reasons why I reached out to Dave and Jack about doing this. Automation and streamlined operations are replacing workers. Middle class wages and job opportunities are declining. And up to 50% of the US jobs are at risk. So we have the potential for very severe effects on people and society unless new types of jobs are created to replace the ones that have been displaced. And we have to have people who have the knowledge and know-how for these new jobs. And this is what's keeping me up at night. Yeah, we can go back in history and say when the car came along, the blacksmith was displaced, but a lot of people got jobs in the car industry. And it seems like something is different here, at least maybe in this transition that we're living through, that a lot of this productivity is flowing to the bottom line. There's new ways of making value, but we're not seeing that burst in new jobs in these new sectors at anywhere near the number or the income. Yes, the, the people who are the one percenters are doing great, but it's, it's this other group that I think uh, presents a, a very important concern for us. Now to prosper in the future, what our committee concluded is, is that individuals, businesses, communities, and nations must embrace the future and strengthen their ability to make value. So we're trying to make the case you have to think about the world differently than just making things. It's making value. There are new opportunities that are surfacing and companies that have proven to be disruptors, innovators, entrepreneurs, the ones who've been successful disruptors are doing great. I mean, you look at Tesla, and you say to yourself, okay, they've had market caps as high as 30 billion. GM's market cap today is on the order of 50 billion. GM owns Corvette. Now, would you rather own the intellectual property of the Corvette, the Bowling Green plant, that customer base, the brand of the Corvette, or Tesla? Now, that's kind of a toss up in my mind. But there's no way there's $30 billion of market cap in GM because of the Corvette. So something's going on here. So the disruptors, Uber, valuations as high as $40 billion uh, with Uber. So when you get it right, it's, it's fantastic. But not, not many people are getting it that right. So the best way to help the people at risk of being left behind, according to our committee, is to advance their skills. Uh, importantly, what are those skills? So it's not necessarily traditional STEM education. Certainly what we're teaching in uh, elementary, middle, and high school may need to be different. But I'm as concerned about our alumni and about people in their 30s and 40s and 50s who are going to be disrupted from what we're talking about here. You know, Dave, I really thought it was ingenious for you to take the brand of Michigan Engineering with digital education, allow an alumni to be able to continue to educate themselves. But if we can understand what the skills are for making value in the future, is there a way we can reach out to anyone who has an affiliation with us and help them better position? We also have to create an environment for innovation in the US that continually attracts and creates skilled jobs and then make America the best place in the world to make value. So that's sort of where we landed in our work. So companies have to adopt these best practices train their workforces, and examine their business models for new ways to make value. Communities, governments, and educators must help improve the skills of current and future workers, strengthen local innovation networks, and encourage long-term investments that lead to these uh, new products and businesses. Um, very importantly, we felt this was a team sport. So business shouldn't be off doing it one way, with universities doing it a different way, and governments doing it in another way. So cooperative actions. Again, we have examples of that here on campus, but share the responsibility to educate, uh, collaborate on best practices and enable more entrepreneurs, and then be inclusive to stimulate innovation through diversity. So that's kind of what, what we took away from this. Um, so as I was preparing for today, uh, over the last two days, these are just four headlines that I happen to come across. These are just from the last two days. More robots coming to US factories. Falling oil prices cost 100,000 jobs. Who would have thought oil would have gone from over $100 a barrel to below 40 in six months? And states like North Dakota, who are just printing money, suddenly are seeing unemployment like this. Wages are stuck where they were two decades ago. This happened to be middle class wages adjusted for inflation. And nearly half of U.S. households have, have almost no savings. 
so I, I don't want to sound like I'm panicking or draconian, but I'm, I am concerned that we're potentially facing um, a defining challenge of our time and that how we think about innovation, technology, and work together is really, really important. Um, think about sustainability and the example I gave on mobility. I believe a two-person pod, recognizing 90% of the trips we make today are one- and two-person trips, that weighs 1,000 pounds, that's electrically driven, uses renewable fuel, drops you off at your door, picks you up at your door, is shared. I believe that is the pathway to sustainable mobility and that we'll have a future where we can move around and not worry about climate change. But the trade-off for that is a lot of jobs lost, and I'm not convinced you're going to see new jobs coming into the mobility sector in a quantity at incomes that replace what we have in manufacturing jobs for this simpler machine and the jobs of drivers across the nation. So that's why I'm here today. Now, University of Michigan is already helping considerably to make value through education, research, and technology transfer. Uh, doing a fantastic job in my judgment. Um, the question I wanted to have for our discussion today is what else might we do to help our students, alumni, faculty, and staff, companies, Michigan, America, other nations, make value in the future? So is there other things we should be doing beyond what we're already doing? And I'm, I don't know everything that's going on, so I'm at risk of being presumptuous. I have some thought starters. Um, maybe I'll tee that up, and then we can answer questions, and then we can decide how we want to handle the discussion. So here are, are my thought starters. Um, first, I think we need to agree on what is inevitable and be sure that U of M is in front of this. Uh, I think that's one of the most important management lessons I've ever learned. You know, good to great, get, get in front of the inevitable. So if the picture I've painted here, which isn't my picture, it's our National Academy Committee picture, if a lot of what is said in this report is inevitable, we need to be in front of it. Because we're one of the greatest public universities in the world, and we need to set the example by being in front of it. Secondly, Investigate and, and codify best practices for making value and develop effective methods for teaching them at all levels. I don't think you can go out and buy a book that teaches you how to make value. We all have a gut feel that there are practices out there, integrated systems design, uh, you know, how we do prototyping with 3D printing and all of that stuff. But could our university become known for the, the school that stepped forward and, and really organize this in a way that it can be taught and understand how it should be taught in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and throughout one's career. Apply these principles and practices to UM, University of Michigan's creating higher value for education, research, and production operations. If we really understand how value is made in the future, we know what those best practices are, we probably should walk the talk. And then deeply understand the future of work and the knowledge and know-how required to prosper in this future. Define standards for employment fitness for people of all ages and comprehend how technology will keep shaping this. When I was in sixth or seventh grade, President Kennedy um, embarked upon the Presidential Council for Physical Fitness, so I'm dating myself a bit. And we had like six exercises, a sprint, a distance run, push-ups, set-ups, pull-ups that we had to meet a minimum standard on to get certified. And I was extremely proud to meet those targets. And quite honestly, it impacted me throughout my whole life to try to stay physically fit. Is there an analogy here for employment fitness that we can instill in younger people that will motivate them for understanding what's required for employment fitness? I do believe a big part of the solution is with individuals. But not every individual gets to be on a committee to understand making value. And therefore, we need to help these individuals know what they have to be able to do to be employment fit. So those are four thought starters. Another one is understand sustainability and jobs. Um, I really think we're going to wake up and, and we're going to have a tug of war here. <laughs> we're going to want a sustainable future. We absolutely should. But I think the root cause of sustainability, lack of sustainability, is waste. It's wasted mass. It's wasted design. And if our pathway to eliminating waste is through productivity and better utilization of everything, are we, are we at conflict here? Maybe we are. 
and then understand why small business startups are declining. And that was one of the trends we uncovered in our background research, and it's an alarming trend in the U.S. that we need to address. On a more provocative level, maybe we should establish the U.M. Commission on Prospering in the 21st Century. So MIT got a lot of good press from their Commission on Industrial Productivity in 1989. Maybe we ought to do one in 2015 where we codify these fundamentals. Uh, we define the 21st century work systems and jobs and the 21st century education in all fields and at all levels, 21st century economics. I think part of the confusion on what's going on here, I don't mean to pick on the field of economics, but they tend to use a lot of data and the data tends to get collected in sectors. So you've got the manufacturing sector and the service sector. So people get trapped in this belief that we've transitioning from manufacturing to service. I don't think it's that simple. I think the data are making us think that way as opposed to what's really going on. Is there a new world of economics when information is free? And with these driverless shared vehicles, if we're down to 10 cents a mile, which I think is doable, why don't we just make mobility free? And what else can we get out there that's free? And how does that change fundamental economic principles? 21st century policies for education, immigration, investment, and equality of opportunity, and then the infrastructure. So that's kind of what I put together for today. Um, it, was, it was fun to be on the committee. Uh, we're, a number of us are out doing what I'm doing today, uh, talking to groups like this to try to get this message out there. We hope it'll resonate with some of the presidential candidates and some of the other people running for office and open to discussion. I think we've got plenty of time for a little bit of discussion. So questions and discussion. So it's not just, oh, it's snowing in Detroit. My flight's going to be delayed. It's, it was raining in thunder in Atlanta three hours ago, and that is now starting to affect the flights out of Detroit.